Old School Lane Casual Chats is brought to you by OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with Channel Frederator, Manic Expression, The Comic Book Cast, and The Araminta Show. new episode of casual chats i am patricia and i am here with two amazing special guests uh returning from this podcast we have matthew clickstein who is the author of slimed and oral history of nickelodeon's golden age uh who was responsible for um the on your mark documentary and uh for this coming book that we're going to be discussing about in just a moment so welcome back matthew thank you very much patricia and um and our new guest we have is somebody that i'm really ex- you know i'm really honored to announce that is actually here on casual chats but um you may know him as a longtime writer for the simpsons and uh the creator of the critic we have mike rice welcome Oh, it's Reese. Actually, we're <laughs> off to a fine start. No, that's okay. When I when I had Matthew here um, on my first podcast interview, I was like, uh, "Is it Clickstein or Clickstein?" So, yeah, I'm good with la- names, am I? <laughs> but no, th- uh, thank you, Mike. I really do appreciate it. That's great. Yes, clearly you have a problem with Jews, and that may <laughs> account for your popularity. <laughs> well, um, I just want to let you know that at least one quarter of the people that I've had on this podcast have been Jewish, and they've all been wonderful. So, um, yeah. <laughs> all right. So uh, today we're going to actually be talking about um, their newest project, which is a book titled Springfield Confidential, Jokes, Secrets, and Outright Lies from a Lifetime Writing for the Simpsons. So I want to know... Uh, what made you decide to finally pen down this book, Mike? What made you decide to finally tell your side of the story? Yes, I want to tell this story and uh, have Matt jump in and see if I'm telling it wrong. But it was it was about two years ago. I got a call from Matt, who uh, I, I think I talked to on the phone. I'd never met the guy. And he called with a proposition that he and I were going to go across America. We were going to drive around America on a lecture tour. And... During the day, he would transcribe Mike Reese's take on America, and we were going to do a book, and it wasn't going to have any Simpsons in it at all. And I said, all right, that sounds great. I love a road trip. So here we are two years later. We've never been in a car together. We didn't go anywhere, and the book is 90% Simpsons. Wow. Yeah, I would say, I would say that's about right. Uh it, as with many, many things, uh, I'm even dealing with that with a new project right now. I know Mike has dealt with that. We talk about it even a little in the book about the evolution of how the critic became the critic, which was something completely different in every possible way in the beginning, which Mike can talk about maybe in a little bit here. But this, the, my idea was originally to do a road trip with Mike. I knew him through interviews we had done over the years about other things and just i have a tendency to become friendly with people i interview very much like yourself patricia and yeah as mike says i i pitched him a completely different idea i thought we could do a road trip we can get mike's take on america and comedy um unfortunately as it went or fortunately however you want to put it as it went through the 
machine and the the cogs and various versions of the proposal it turned into something uh, uh you know three no 180 degrees different um and basically it became mike's memoirs of working on the simpsons uh with a little smidge in there snuck in about the critic and some of the amazing uh, work he's done elsewise uh, with johnny carson and nash lampoon harvard lampoon uh, and all the animated movies he's worked on as well so uh it was it was a wild experience uh I do hope one day we can still take a road trip together in a car and just at least go and get a hamburger. Uh, but yeah, I will say, Patricia, real quick, one thing that is interesting, as Mike pointed out, we had never met each other in person in about, I think it was a good four or five years we knew each other just over phone and email. Um, and the first time I met him, I was coming to his apartment to stay for a few nights to start interviewing him for this book proposal idea. So Mike is the kind of person where if you interview him just once, he'll let you stay in his apartment for a few days. <laughs> Patricia, Patricia, you're more than welcome. <laughs> wow, I mean, I'm honored. Def- maybe sometime whenever I'm at your area, then maybe I'll take up on your proposal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anybody who interviews Mike can go and stay at his place. The, the, Mike and his wife will make food for them. The, He'll uh, he'll uh, do you know really put him up and uh, you know send you away with a nice gift bag too. So for all potential interviewees, <laughs> interviewers. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you heard got, it here first. I'll I'll jump in on the story because that's part. It's a funny story that we started with a completely different book, uh, but it's a great thing too because if Matt had called me up and said we're going to sell your memoirs and you're going to write a book about the Simpsons. I would have nixed it instantly. It was just something I never wanted to write a memoir. I thought it would be presumptuous for me to write a story when the Simpsons is the work of about 300 people. So I love that I got just sort of eased into it so gradually and it turned, you know, and then there was just the realization nobody wanted to hear about me. Everybody wanted to hear about the Simpsons. So I'm glad it happened this way, and I'm I'm very proud of the work we did, and people are loving the book so far. Well, I'm really happy to hear that, especially since I think nowadays with, um, I think there's been like a bit of a resurgence of The Simpsons. There's been a lot of books on The Simpsons, and um, yeah, there's just so many things on social media that still keeps The Simpsons relevant, and I think that... Um, you know, knowing more about the history of your perspective of The Simpsons is actually going to be really interesting because um, I'm not even joking when I say this. There are at least four or five different Simpsons podcasts where they do recaps of an episode every single week and they would ha- occasionally have like a special guest. And there are so many Simpsons books. So, there. I mean, even though that, um, you know, The Simpsons has been around for like almost 30 years at this point, which is crazy. It's still as relevant to our pop culture as ever. It's an amazing thing just this year for the show to suddenly explode again. And I'm not sure based on what. I'm very happy that people, for whatever reason, I think it's because we picked Trump. I think because (laughs) I, I literally can only think we saw Trump coming in the year 2000. And then we got a couple of other things right that. People started tuning back into the show just to see what we would predict next. Oh and- my God, I'm t- I'm not even joking when I say this, but ever there have been so many instances in which I've seen a lot of articles discussing about what did The Simpsons predict, and yep. there's not only the whole you know Trump's going to be president, but there's also the fact that oh um you know they're going to be uh, what was it like uh, Star Wars and 20th Century Fox is going to be bought by Disney and and a whole bunch of other things. It's 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 insane. They're like I I think they're hiding a crystal ball in there somewhere. <laughs> What's been fun is I think again all this pro- prophecy nonsense. You know we're psychics like all other psychics are psychics, which is we're not. But uh, <laughs> it got people watching the show again, and we we had after twenty eight years we we had this particularly good season where people were tuning in and saying, hey, the show's still got it, and we're very happy they're they're back and watching us and after 29 we just finished our 29th year on the air and we're the number two show on fox so the show could seems like it it could run forever yeah i'm curious what is number one uh it's empire 
Oh, and, oh, okay, yeah. That's one. That's a newer show, though. But that that makes sense. But still, I mean, number two for a show that's been running for almost thirty years. That's that's very impressive. And so you're uh, telling uh, me, it's a nice Patricia. Day. Yeah, Patricia. If I may, just I, I want to pop in there, kind of uh, as as a fan of the show and someone like yourself, and I know a lot of your listeners who grew up on The Simpsons. Uh, I have to say, I have to agree with Mike because, you know, some of my friends that I've been telling, you know, one of the big comments that comes up, of course, is, you know, everyone loves The Simpsons, but, you know, a lot of people, especially our age, kind of maybe stopped watching it a little bit after the last few years or whatnot. So people have been saying, well, how is it now? Or I haven't watched the episodes in a long time. And, I, and I've said, you know, I've been, I've been watching it again myself because of the book and whatnot. And now I've become friendly with, you know, more friendly with Mike and some of these other people involved in the show. And, you know, I, I have to say the last season was just sensational. It really was. And in fact, I've uh, one of the great uh, perks of this job working on the book with Mike was I became friendly with Al Jean, who's been running the show since 2001. has been a longtime writing partner of Mike's in the past. We talk a lot about him in the book. But I, I swear, I, I email Mike or I email Al almost every week now. And I say, man, this last episode was fantastic. You guys really nailed it. Or I'll mention it to Mike also. I just there have been so many episodes of uh, this last season that I highly, highly recommend. So anyone listening to this saying, "Oh, maybe I should check out The Simpsons again," please do. Especially if I may, Mike. My yeah. favorite episode of this last season was the first one, The Surf Sins. It's it's back in kind of game of you know sort of medieval time. I was so impressed with the amount of work you guys put in, the jokes that were everywhere. I mean, Patricia, you know that one of the key things of The Simpsons is the jokes that they have in the background. I mean, it was just it was amazing the amount of work that they did for that one episode. So anyone listening to this who's kind of maybe stopped watching The Simpsons over the years or whatnot, check out this last season because Mike's right. They did something amazing with this, and it wasn't just the, the political stuff or whatever. It was it was. There were some really, really great episodes this season. Terrific. Mm. Yeah, I'm actually curious, um, Mike, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners would like to know. So, how did you um, how did you get involved with working on The Simpsons? Well, I, I always say I got the job the same way I got a wife, which was I was not the first choice, but I was available uh, because I was working on it's Gary Shandling show. It's a, it's a sort of a well-remembered show. It was also the lowest rated show on television. And I was on a summer break from that show when I get a call from Sam Simon, one of the creators of The Simpsons. And he goes, hey, would you like to work on our new show, The Simpsons? And I said, why are you calling me? I don't know you. And he said, because no one else in town will take the job. And that was how I got up. It was when The Simpsons was beginning, you know, it was a cartoon for adults. There hadn't been animation in prime time in 30 years. Uh, and it was on the Fox Network, which was a brand new entity. And no one had, not only did people have no faith in the show that it would work, but they sort of thought it would be a career killer. So I took the job. It was just a fun summer job for me. Uh, and I didn't tell anyone what I was doing because I thought I, I had hit rock bottom. And so that was it. And then the show, when it debuted, it, it, it was this amazing moment. Our, our first night where the reviews came in from all over America and the critics saw what none of us saw. That it was just that, hey, this is a game changer. Hey, that nobody's seen a show like this on TV. Isn't it amazing? Because we, we literally just thought we were going to watch it. And we said, well, let's just have fun with this. Let's just make a show for ourselves. Yeah, and, you know, I've had Paul Germain a handful of times on this show, and, you know, he also worked on The Simpsons, and then eventually he would go off and to do Rugrats and Recess and various other projects, but... Yeah, it, it seems like it's pretty much like the same stories every time that I have somebody who worked on a show um, that they said, oh, this wasn't my original choice. I just did this for maybe like an off shot, thinking that it wouldn't last very long. And then it became like this huge hit. And we wanted to do something that we enjoyed because um, if we enjoyed it, we hope that they enjoy it. And it became that way. And I and it, yeah, absolutely. It became like a massive change because not since the Flintstones so we had an animated primetime show and um, in a sense it was more contemporary and it was more of 
a whole bunch of jokes and, um, you know, p- poking fun at suburban life and introducing a whole bunch of characters. And, you know, every single moment has become incredibly iconic and... It, I mean, even various words like doe or meh have become pretty much <laughs> like staples in our own speaking language. I mean, even they even have it in the Oxford Dictionary, which is um, incredible to think of. So, yeah, I think that, um, I, I mean, for people who are thinking about like, oh, you know, th- what I'm doing right now isn't going to go anywhere. And if you're... Um, kind of afraid to take a risk i think that um you know but by taking a risk uh, and you know taking a shot at something that you think wouldn't do well or you think that oh i'm passionate about this but i'm not going to be successful at it um you never know i i would suggest that you know take your chances and if it works out then it works out great and if not then you can learn something from it Yes, I do tell that you know there's a very slim part of the book where i give a little advice to new writers and uh I do tell them, take every job that comes your way because you never know what's going to be the great one that'll turn your career around. And I I make the case, one of the last jobs I took, uh, I just did it as a friend. I worked on a show called Homeboys in Outer Space. Ah. Yes, if you've heard of it, this is a show, this is a show not only got canceled, it got a whole network canceled. There used to be a network, UPN, and it's gone now. And Homeboys was on it. And Homeboys is considered one of the 50 worst shows of all time. And yet the, the writers, who were all writers in their first job, were fantastic. You know, they were terrific writers. And uh, they all went on to much better things. One of the writers, as soon as it got canceled, we took them right over to The Simpsons. Four of the other writers went off and helped create Family Guy. So that's an amazing turnaround. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I- I've heard of that show, but I've never seen it. But, yeah, I mean, it just goes to show you that, you know, just because you work on something that doesn't succeed, that doesn't mean that all the people who are involved with it are, you know, a bunch of uh, slack-offs. I mean, those people who went off and did better, bigger and better things, that just shows about how much, you know, talent that they had. And yeah, I I really, I mean, I think that, you know, there, I think there have been a few cases in which maybe some people have forgotten about that, but, um, you just have to remember that if something that you think is, you know, in your opinion, that is not good, then just remember that, um, the people who are working on it have a strong passion with, um, you know, doing the best that they can under various circumstances and then, uh, maybe they, they, you know, they have to work with various mandated decisions and then, you know, somebody else has to, um, you know, go up into the higher ups and tell them about what they're doing. And in a matter of time, you know, uh, if that thing, you know, leaves, then, you know, they can do off something else. And then if that works out for them, then that's fine. But I think, you know, yeah, absolutely. That people who have worked on other stuff, like whether it be The Simpsons or The Critic or Family Guy or what have you. Uh, It just goes to show them that they don't have to be weighed down for something that just didn't work out the first time. They can try again and do something else. Uh, There's no bad credit, really. There's no, because if you work on a show, even if it's terrible, your next employer will know, well, at least somebody somebody had faith in this guy. Yeah. So, um, I'm actually curious, because uh, I'm sure that you have a lot of interesting stuff in the book. Uh, um, of course, mostly Simpsons, but um, were there something in the book that you wanted to put in, but you couldn't, either due to time constraints, or it just didn't fit well in the book, or you were going a little bit above uh, the certain amount of pages that you had to write? There was only one thing. It was funny, because the, the, there have been a, several books about the Simpsons, and they're all... 250 pages long and I would say the the sim, pure Simpson section of my book is 250 pages but for some reason they wanted that magic number of 320 so I just wanted to make those other 70 pages as exciting as possible so I only talked about people had heard of that I'd worked on and that's Johnny Carson and Alf and working with Gary Shanling and working on animated like the Despicable Me films and Ice Age. The one story that got cut uh, goes right back to what we're talking about. It was the first sitcom I worked on, which was called Nine to Five. And this was a show, if I have time to tell the story, 
I used to hate watch this show in the early days before there was DDRs or VC and VCRs. Uh, I just used to love how horrible this terrible sitcom was. And then one day I get a call from that sitcom saying, would you like to work here? And I said, sure. I was out of work and I went to work and I, I walked in thinking it would just be full of circus pinheads. I thought they'd be the biggest idiots in the world. Uh, but in fact, they were all very talented writers. They, it was a very talented group. But nothing could save this show that had just sort of a bad premise and bad leadership. And that's, that's a great lesson. You know, it is, you can't save a bad show with good writers. And uh, so here I am finally, I got my first job working on the worst show in the world I've ever seen. And then I got fired. I got fired about three months in because I wasn't good enough to work on the worst TV show ever. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. But that was it. But I met somebody on that show who recommended me to the producers of ALF. And uh, ALF was the first hit show I ever worked on. And that, and then sort of my career took off from there. So, again, take any job. Yes. And by taking all of these jobs that you did previously, what were you able to learn when working on The Simpsons or after working on The Simpsons for your other projects? What kind of lessons did you take into it that you still follow today? There's a good thing. Al Jean, who Matt Clickstein did. Uh, I got to single out Matt, by the way. He, he brings something so great to this book. It's not just me nattering on and on, telling old stories. Uh, he interviewed all my friends and co-workers, cast members from The Simpsons and John Lovitz and Conan O'Brien and my partner, Al Jean. And that's, it's, it's, it's a great thing because they pop up every once in a while in the book and sort of check my bullshit and uh, they, you know, tell their version of what I'm telling in the story. So it's real value added to the book. But so Al Jean, who never says a bad word about any, anyone, Al Jean, the showrunner at Simpsons, says that the show 9 to 5 taught him everything not to do in running a sitcom. And I'll give it that. I, I, I really learned a lot of wrong things to do on that show. Uh, from that point on, I was very lucky in that I never had to write for a normal sitcom again. I never had to write for a show like, you know, that's just a family, a bunch of people sitting on a couch and that kind of thing. I got to write for fun, inventive shows that wanted to push the imagine and push the boundaries. Yeah. So, um, Matthew, I, I mean, what, what were your favorite um, moments when working on the book, whether it be like, you know, with Al or with Mike or with um, any of the other people that you got a hold of for the book? Um, you know, I, I, as, as Mike said, thank you, Mike, for saying all that. It was really a pleasure working on the book, obviously, especially as a lifetime fan of the show. Um, but uh, and a fan of Mike's. I mean, I've always loved the critic as well. It's weird, Patricia, to be in the same room with someone. And I actually say Hachi Machi a lot anyway. And so to be with the guy who created that more or less um, <clears throat> that catchphrase. Uh, is you know it's just it's it's exciting and exhilarating sometimes to have those little moments um but i, I would say uh of all the the times that i had working with mike on this book uh, just just the time that he and i got to spend together was really invaluable um as i said mike and, and his lovely wife denise were incredibly hospitable to me uh they let me stay at their place uh they let me go with them to a few events um i got to go with mike and denise to harvard where mike delivered an amazing uh, speech about the Simpsons and his career, which he'll be doing uh, again and again now with this book as well uh, in the future to come here. I got to go with them to an event that he did in Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, so I got to spend time with them again at their apartment, just me and Mike walking around New York, going and getting lunch together, going and, and seeing a movie together. Um, you know, I to listen to him talk about the Simpsons and his comedy career and Johnny Carson and The Critic, uh, was uh, was fun, but, uh, you know, he, he does have a lot of this great stuff in the book, and he does have so much to say when you're talking with him, as you're hearing now in this podcast interview. This is a guy who's been around for 40 years now in this business, has had such an impact on it, 
from uh, books and stories and articles to movies and TV shows. So, and just joke writing for huge comics like Joan Rivers and others that, you know, he, he can't help but spill out really, really fantastic kernels of information. And for a still relatively young writer like myself, uh, I just felt like I was getting a master's class in not just comedy, but in writing, in storytelling, uh, and the business. Uh, and one thing that Mike does really well also, as you can tell again from this interview and as you'll see from the book, is he doesn't bullshit at all. And I don't think he has the ability to do that. Uh, no euphemisms, no patronizing. If he doesn't like something, he'll tell you. If he doesn't like somebody, he'll tell you. Uh, and, you know, he can be very diplomatic and, and respectful and polite, obviously. He's a good guy. But, uh, you know, just hanging out with him, I got so much information, I almost felt like I should have been paying him. Uh, I really felt, feel like I came out of these last two years with a master's degree in, you know, the last 40 years of comedy. And, and as funny as it was, as nice as it was to get to know Mike and his lovely wife and some of his other friends I got to know over the years uh, with him, I, I just feel like I learned so much. And you're right, Patricia that we obviously couldn't fill up the book with so much of these other stories and pieces of advice. So I kind of feel like I got to be the, you know, this, this exclusive, you know, reader or listener of, of Mike's information that hopefully he'll be able to get out in other articles or other books or when we do like maybe a paperback with more pages or something like that. But I, I would say that's the best part for me is very selfishly. I got to pick Mike's brain for two years and come, came away with it with, with so much information. I, I can't wait to uh, apply that in my own work. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the way that it sounds, I mean, you know, I, the, the whole road trip thing, I would say that just make that into a documentary. It sounds a lot more interesting. Yeah, you want to pay for it? <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> just give us, give us 300 grand and we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to call my bank. But uh, no, seriously, I, I think that, you know, the the, the fact that, um, you know, you have such a passion for everything that you were able to learn from Mike, it's, it, it's, it's very inspiring. And, you know, the fact that you're right, that Mike has been a uh, huge, um, res you know, he was hugely responsible for basically just laying down the foundation of everything that we associate with um, pop culture, whether it be Alf or The Simpsons or The Critic. And the fact that we do get to now know about his perspective is actually very fascinating. And I'm sure that, you know, when uh, the time that we're going to be releasing this um, episode of Casual Chats, the book will be out. So, uh, yeah, for anybody who is interested in picking up this book, I, I implore you to do so. Um, now, the fact that you uh, yourself don't take any, you know, bullshit, I, I take it that, you know, a lot of that per bit of personality was what made you uh, inspired to, you know, take on the critic, right? Because pretty much Jay Sherman, he tells it how he sees it. If he doesn't like something, then he'll flat out and say it, even though that pretty much everybody wants him to not say it at all. Yeah, it certainly made the character very fun to write, and... You know, I like to think I'm not the critic, but boy, everything he says about movies or about celebrities, uh, that's really coming out of my mouth or Al Jean's mouth. We, uh, I believe the things the critic says. Uh, but yeah, it's it's funny. It's uh, I'll even tell the story real quick because this is the kind of story that turns up on The Simpsons, which was. My, I used to lie all the time when I was a little kid. I used to lie constantly. And then my sister figured out I had to tell. See, and I don't want my wife to know what it is or I'm doomed. But she figured out a little something I do whenever I tell a lie. And once she figured that out, I couldn't lie anymore. And I just stopped lying. And that's, and it's, that's really hobbled my career in Hollywood because... Whenever you're meeting with executives, they're telling you terrible ideas, which is fine. But then they go, what do you think of that? And that's where I go, I, I got to be honest with you. That's the worst idea I ever heard in my life. So I've, I've never been able to play the game that way. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm lucky I've gone as far as I can with, because I, I am afflicted with honesty. 
Yeah. And it's because of that um, brutal honesty with the critic that a lot of people um, was, a, you know, basically, you know, I, I'm, you know, not, I mean, as somebody who's a content creator for like over, over seven years, uh, as somebody who has been doing like blog articles and who's done podcasts and various topics uh, in videos, um, you know, I've had a lot of colleagues who, when they see something, they just flat out and say, okay, this is how I feel. And there's somebody, whether it be like, uh, a, you know, like a commentator or maybe a follower who just says, you know, I don't agree with that. And then they, then they basically just say, you know, I call it like I see it. And even with like recent things, it's like if a trailer for a movie or a TV show comes out and everybody makes like their opinions about like, oh, it's going to be the worst thing ever. And, you know, they always bring up that clip of Jay Sherman saying if... You know, if you um, basically, if you um, if you don't want to see a, a movie that you think is going to be bad, then don't go see it. If you don't pay to see a bad movie, then they'll stop making bad movies. And every single time that there's a movie that is really bad or a TV show that's really bad, they always use that clip from the critic, basically oh. saying, "If you don't like it, then don't pay or don't watch it because then they'll stop making it." Oh wow! I didn't know they were using it. That was written, by the way, by a guy named. Tom Brady, and not the not the football player, but I believe that's the first script he ever wrote. And I remember, uh, you know, we were taking a chance on the guy, and I remember reading that passage, you know, this very impassioned speech in the middle of the episode, and I said, wow, that's great. And I think it went on the air, and Wall Street Journal picked up on it. Wow, this is something really special. So that was, that was really a, a piece of great writing I wish I had done. Yeah. But it's... No, I'm actually curious. Um, now you've had a, a few critics on the critics, such as you know Siskel and Eber. Um, were there any other critics that you wanted to have featured on the show but couldn't, or they flat out refused because they they were like feeling threatened that they were kind of like being spoofed on? The answer is no. Critics, as much as they want to put themselves above the fray, they were. Every one of them wanted to be on the show. Every one of them was shameless. Every one of them did whatever we wrote for them, never questioned, you know, the content of it. So, no, I mean, uh, who's I, what's his name? The big books about TV, the guy to every movie on TV, uh, whatever his name is, he's the one guy I wanted to get on the show. We just didn't, we didn't run long enough. But I think we could have had every in the world on that. Was it Tom Shales? Was it Tom Shales, Mike? Oh, not Tom Shales. I don't know why the guy's name is eluding me, but uh, it's not important. Yeah, don't yeah. worry about it. Basically, with um, the critic, he would always do like a, he would always review like a spoof of a movie, um, whether it be like uh, Howard's End or uh, Sense of a Woman or Ace Ventura. With today's movies nowadays, what do you think the spoof names would be of nowadays? What did, I'm sorry, see that last part again? You know, like, like today's movies, like nowadays, you know, we have like Black Panther and we have like Deadpool and stuff like that. What would be the spoof names be for like if the critic were to review them? Oh, I sure don't know. I, uh, <laughs> you know, this is, this is the reason I am a comedy writer and not a comedian is I take my time to think up these things. You have to, if everyone will come back in six hours, I'll give you a list of great names, but I don't have it offhand, but certainly... It is the kind of thing, this is a whole ripe new medium that would have been great for the critic to teach superhero movies. It's, it is amazing to me, too, that people still watch the critic. I mean, we did, it was 23 episodes, I don't know, 20 years ago. And if you needed any question, that if you had any question that the show was dated, the first thing you see, the very opening shot, of every episode of The Critic is the World Trade Center. It's a beautiful shot in New York with the World Trade Center. And yet still, people are watching it and watching and loving these parodies of Steven Seagal movies or whatever movie at the time we were making fun of. Yeah, I, I think the reason why uh, a lot of people still love it was because it was like a benchmark of pretty much our culture in the internet where everybody just wants to critique everything and they think they're... They're they're the ones who are claiming that their word is law, and they yeah. they have like this 
snooty personality or there's some people who actually claim to like everything and to point out all the positives of it but then they just overlook the flaws so i think you know not only that but you know basically um you had you you had cutaway gags and featuring spoofs of things even you know years before family guy and um the fact that um, I think that every single person, whether they, um, you know, like to read books or watch movies or or play games or what have you, I think that there's a little bit of a Jay Sherman inside them. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. That's just every, I mean, it's the line. Everyone's a critic now. Everybody loves to jump on everything. Yeah. So. So. And that's Go ahead. In this in this age of rebooting everything, of course, there's been a ton of talk about rebooting the critic, and uh, the only you know I think it would be a done deal if we went anywhere, but I'm a little reluctant to do it. Uh, and Al Jean, of course, my partner on it was is busy running the Simpsons, but I go it's it's a different world. There's there are no more TV critics the way Jay Sherman was a critic, and we could do him, you know, like Mark Maron. I, that was my pitch: is he's reduced to doing a podcast out of his garage, and that's as famous as he is. But it all, I don't know. It, it, the other people seem to think it sounded a little too depressing. So I think I think the show might have been a little ahead of its time, and uh, the. Just sort of the premise of it doesn't quite work these days. That's completely fair. Uh, Patricia, I'll say uh, one of the other uh, perquisites of working on this project is I got to read a lot of uh, unpublished and unproduced work of Mike's. And uh, one of my favorite pieces was uh, uh, a a pilot for John Lovitz that they were going to be doing. It was going to be like the John Lovitz show. It was going to have kind of a sense of, <clears throat> of sort of like it's Gary Shanley's show, or it would be kind of John as a character of himself. Uh, and you know, I got to read the pilot script, and I I thought it was very very funny. I thought it was very well put together. I know Mike, you can maybe talk about it a little bit more if you want. I don't know if you do or not, but um, I know you guys had had uh, uh, done a reading live and that kind of thing, and had a nice audience there. But when I interviewed John Lovitz about it, we talked about it a little. I mean, I was even pushing John, frankly. I said, look, John, this could be like a pilot for a live action version of, you know, the critic or, or kind of an off to the critic, which I know John has talked about even more recently about if they were to do something with the critic again, he'd love to do it maybe as a live action show or something like that. But, you know, there's certainly various iterations and versions that they can do and you know, I could see, you know, even though they wrote that script back in 97 or whatever it was, I could see it running today with a few pop culture reference changes and it would it would go really well. So, um, you know, you, you, you just never know. So, I, you know, I might be wrong here, Mike, but I, I think that, that even that is a start or, or doing something with John again in that regard. You, you never know. Yeah, absolutely. You never know. Like The Tick, for example. The Tick was a superhero show in the 90s, and nowadays it has a live-action version on Amazon Prime, and that's become like really successful. Um, you know, the new generation of kids are getting into Riverdale, which is essentially like a more dramatic version of the Archie comics, and that's becoming really successful. I would love to see, you know, John Lovitz as like um, a live version of Jay Sherman and, or, you know, uh, you know doing various things uh you know sticking to his um jokes i i would love to see that absolutely i think that would be great um yeah i'd I'd love to know more about it because i think that the other time that i did hear about like a a, a live action version of an animated uh series with a character i think i did hear once a long time ago about they they wanted to do a live action version of Krusty the Clown, but it, they didn't get around to doing it because it would have been too expensive. So yeah, I'm actually curious about this John Lovitz project. Well, he's a national treasure. He's uh, uh, yes, he should be around much more because people just love John, and it's not hard to write for him because that the guy you see on TV is who he is, and it just pours out of him 24 hours a day and he always always makes me laugh so maybe maybe this is this is the seed this is the kick in the pants i needed to get going again yes and if it does happen you heard it here first 
<laughs> I will take no credit for it, but you heard it here first. All right. So, yeah, I think we can start wrapping things up. So, um, final words um, for Mike. Um, you know, everything that you've done over the past, you know, 40 years with all of your projects and all of your newer stuff, like for the Despicable Me movies and for Ice Age, um, when looking back on everything that you've done, um, what do you think that, you know, with all, you know, with your memoir writings and that's going to be released to the public, what do you think of, like, the legacy as a whole? What is uh, the legacy? You know, there's a couple of things I want to say about the book because uh, sure, absolutely. Which is just because of the way we're portraying it was. I guess we thought it was going to be a memoir of me and my life, and I realized very early on. I even I don't want to read that book. So it's more. It's a it's a travelogue. It's a memoir of the places I've been and the things I've seen happen. And I feel like I'm sort of a a background character in my own book. It's just sort of, here's what I lived through, these amazing shows, but I don't think there's an overdose of me in the book. It's not that kind of book. It's just sort of, here's what, here's how Hollywood works. Here's how a, a classic comedy show works. Here's how a flop comedy show works. So, uh, so I don't even think about legacy. I say somewhere in the book uh, that even though I've devoted 30 years of my life to The Simpsons, if I'd never been born, it would be exactly as good. It's the it's the work of many, many people, and I'm just lucky I got to be one of them. Uh, the other point to make about the book is just it's really funny. We keep talking about it being instructional, and you can learn from it, and it's a document. The book is really funny because if you can't write, if you don't have a book of funny stories after 30 years of working in comedy, you really haven't been paying attention. So... Uh, more than anything, I think people will have a lot of fun reading it. And the one last thing I'll say about the book is uh, we finished the book, I would say, November 1st. And since that time, I've done a lot of public appearances and met with literally hundreds and hundreds of fans. And nobody has had a question for me where I couldn't say, oh, it's in the book. It's in the book. Anything anyone wants to know about The Simpsons uh, happens to be in the book already. So I feel very I feel like it's a really complete job and a fan of the show or even a casual watcher is going to walk away going, all right, I know it all now. All right. Well, that sounds fantastic. So once again, for anybody uh, who's interested, Springfield Confidential, Jokes, Secrets, and Outright Lies from a Lifetime Writing for The Simpsons will be coming out on June 12th. So once again, by the time that I release this uh, podcast episode, the book will already be out on Amazon and, you know, your local book retailers. And I believe that you have an audio version as well. So, yeah, uh, I think that if anybody's a huge fan of The Simpsons or of Mike's other works, then I implore you guys to check it out. Uh, Once again, uh, Mike, Matthew, thank you so much for coming on by. Really do appreciate it. Great. Thank you. A lot of fun. So, um, yeah, uh, is there anything else that you like to plug or self-promote? So, uh... I keep forgetting anyone, you know, I wish people would buy the book. If you don't want to spend the money on the book, please at least follow me on Twitter at Mike Reese Writer. Mike Reese Writer, I give you one good joke every day, just like the Jimmy Fallon show. There you go. <laughs> And it takes a lot less time, too. Um, and uh, Matthew, uh, please plug and promote your stuff. Um, I, well, I, before I, I do some self-promotion myself, I do have to say two quick things um, that uh, just to, as a repose to what Mike just said as a wrap-up. First and foremost, I, I couldn't agree with Mike more. And, you know, it's not any kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, vanity or anything there. The book is extremely funny. And of all the things that, again, when I'm talking with friends of mine about it, I keep saying over and over again, um, you know, I hope that is is a through line that comes out in some of our upcoming reviews. We're really proud of some of the advanced press that we've already gotten, Vanity Fair and whatnot, saying good things about the book. But, you know, I would be so happy and elated, even though I had almost nothing to do with the comedy. It's all Mike. 
but it is laugh out loud funny. You read a lot of books, as I did when I was preparing for this project, and I'm, I'm a comedy nerd, so I read a lot of books about stand-up comics and whatnot. And you have some really, really great stand-up comedy books by some of the best people out there, but rarely are they just jam-packed with jokes the way that this one is. I mean, it almost reads like you're watching an episode of The Simpsons or The Critic or some of the other work that Mike's done. He really applied a lot of that great work into this book, and I'm making it sound more complicated and boring than it is, than it is. but trust me, like, I was sitting here with my wife when she was reading it. I, I had to leave the room because she was laughing so hard, and she still goes through it sometimes, and we'll just be sitting there in between doing other things, and we'll just start laughing. And I myself have read certain lines 15, 20 times now as we've gone through draft after draft, and I will laugh, you know, just over and over again at certain lines. So the book is very, very funny. And I highly recommend it for that point. I will say, in all due respect, Mike, you say this a lot, but I completely disagree with you. I think that The Simpsons would not be the same without you, because without you, there would have been no Al Jean. And without you and no Al Jean, there would have been no classic episodes, like No Disgrace, like uh, uh, with uh, the, the Simpsons going to Marvin uh, Monroe and getting electrocuted in their chairs and just some of those early episodes that you guys worked on together and created some of these amazing characters like Ralph Wiggum and the bullies and so forth. And the show just would not have been the same without those characters. It would have maybe been as funny and it, we would have had other characters and whatnot. But anyone listening to this, you've, you've got a book coming from a guy who really did, in my opinion, I know Mike doesn't agree, <laughs> but in my opinion, had, had did have quite an, an impactful significance on the show. Um, and so I will wrap all of this up with my saying that um, I obviously we're, we're still making some tweaks on the Mark Summers documentary. Uh, as a lot of people probably listening to this probably know, there's been some exciting news in the world of Mark Summers with Double Dare being rebooted. So we're going to be making some tweaks to the documentary for that. We had a great little sneak preview tour through October. We showed it to some people, got some notes from the fans and some from, from some friends. So we're incorporating some of those notes in as well. At this point, it's hard to say exactly when or what we're going to do with it just because of the Double Dare reboot is kind of making some changes to Mark's uh, situation right now and our own, obviously. Uh, but hopefully that movie will come out uh, for a wider audience soon. Um, and otherwise, people can uh, check out some of the other things that I have going on, like my own podcast, Nerts, N-E-R-T-Z, uh, and other things that are going to be coming along here soon. I'm working on other projects. MatthewClickstein.com, that's M A T H E W. K-L-I-C-K-S-T-E-I-N dot com. Everything's there. Uh, and I guess that's it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, another thing, uh, you know, right before we go, I, I did see you post this, but um, I think you're going to be doing some book touring, correct? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So and, uh, I'm going to be leaving off a description down below about um, all the places that they're going to be doing, uh, they're going to be going to, and all the places that you can be seeing these guys or seeing Matthew and a few other people from The Simpsons to, um, you know, talk more about the book. But yeah, for anybody who, um, for all the upcoming dates and the places, then yeah, I, if you are interested, then yeah, then definitely go there. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Yes, it should be fun. If you're in New York or, or L.A. or Gunnison, Colorado, that's our tour. Uh, <laughs> I will be hard to avoid. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's a wrap up, guys. So uh, let us know in the comments below about um, some of your favorite episodes or shows that or movies that Mike has worked on. Uh, if you do have a copy of the book again, by the time that this comes out, uh, what are your thoughts on it? So that's it, everybody. Hope to see you around soon. And thank you for listening. I'll be the biggest thing the world has ever seen. When I team up with Roger or Gene. Judith Christ will be my queen. Nothing's gonna stop me now. This critic's gonna be a superstar. Gonna fly first class, drive a big car. Gonna eat a 10-ton Malamar. Nothing's gonna stop us now. Help me, please! Nothing's gonna stop me. Ow! I said nothing's gonna stop me. Ow! Don't! Yeah! Nothing's gonna stop me. Ow. Hey, me!
Mr. Siskel, look at me. Hey, Mr. Ebert.